Shalom Avraim. Welcome, friends in Hebrew. My name is Tony Pino, and today we're doing part two of our presentation of Hanukkah. But before we begin, let's start out with the blessing of salvation. Let's give all praise and glory and honor to Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah, our Lord, our King, for he's the only way to the Father, and he gives eternal life. So if you know this blessing, go ahead and join in with me. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher Netam Anuet Derech HaYeshua, Babashiach, Yeshua Baruch Hu. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has made the way of salvation through the Messiah Yeshua. Blessed be his name. Amen. So welcome back, everyone. This is part two of our presentation of Hanukkah. And last time together, we talked about the beginning part of the history leading up to the Maccabean Revolt. We haven't quite gotten there yet. So part one is all on the history leading up to that time. When we left off, last time together, we looked at what was called the Grecian citadel that is built right next to the temple. All right, here is a picture of the area where they believe the citadel sat when it was back in the uh, roughly 168, 167. Um, this citadel was built right around that time. It was to help defend the city against, mainly against the Romans or any other invaders. Uh, Antiochus IV is the one that wanted this citadel built. And we talked about this last time, how it would have been um, by the temple area in order to protect it. Uh, this is towards the city of David. And at this time, Antiochus IV has abolished all of the Torah laws. He actually wants to create one empire with one united people, all under, of course, worshiping him as God, as a God, and worshiping Zeus, worshiping, you know, everyone worshiping the same, everyone having the same laws. And of course, there was only one people group that didn't have the same laws and would only worship one. Elohim, and that is the Jewish people. So there are various reasons that rose, and we talked about that last time together on why it came to the point of Antiochus IV had finally had it. He's taken away the Jewish laws. He's taken away their Jewish worship. Um, they actually did a celebration and were celebrating because at one time they had gotten a report that Antiochus IV was dead, uh, and it was a false report. So. That was part of the reason of the lead up to Antiochus IV getting so angry. And he sweeps through Jerusalem, killing tens of thousands of Jews at that time because of what they had been doing. And at this time, he really begins to force Jews to convert over to his way of life. Okay, it's going to be penalty of death if they get caught doing anything pertaining to the Torah. Now the Gentiles filled the temple with debauchery at this time because Antiochus IV had taken over the temple grounds and it was now filled with uncircumcised Gentiles, okay? They uh, engaged in debauchery and reveling. They amused themselves with prostitutes and had intercourse with women even in the sacred courts. They also brought forbidden things into the temple so that the, te uh, the altar was covered with abominable offerings prohibited by the laws, speaking of the laws of Moshe, the Torah. No one could keep the Sabbath or celebrate the traditional feast, not even admit to being a Jew. Moreover, at the monthly celebration of the king's birthday, this was something that Antiochus IV initiated, was they were to now celebrate his birthday every month. And of course, remember, he's called Antiochus the fourth epiphanies, God manifest. All right. The Jews from bitter necessity had to partake of the sacrifices. And when the festivals of Dionysus, who is a fertility goddess, was celebrated, they were compelled to march in his processions wearing wreaths of ivory. Okay, so Jews are, some Jews are being put to death for not participating. Other Jews are being compelled bitterly to participate in these celebrations, celebrating the goddess Dion Dionysus 
and also celebrating the birthday every month of King Antiochus IV. So you see these celebrations, you see these um, parades that they've created that Jews are being forced to march in. And of course, some Jews are submitting to the rule. They're trying to spare their lives, okay? Other Jews are giving up their lives. So again, I'm just kind of reiterating this all, really emphasizing this, because when you get to the first century, and it's talking about, you know, Jewish law, and we're talking about Yeshua and his death and resurrection on whether or not it, it abolished that Jewish law, you can see the discussions need to be had because there's, it's a sensitive topic, amen? They just, less than 200 years prior, had undergone this reign of Antiochus IV. So there's a lot that is in the atmosphere there in the first century during the time of Yeshua. When Yeshua is basically, what he's doing is clearing up the cloudiness of the Torah. He's making it clear, this is how you follow the Torah correctly. Okay, he's not taking away the Torah. He's clarifying the right way to do it because of how clouded it had become, mainly due to oral law. Okay, the oral law of the parashim. Now, not every oral law was bad. Many oral laws Yeshua followed. But there were some that were overbearing and actually violated the Torah. And so much of what we see, I think, is an overreaction of what is occurring here in this time period leading up to Hanukkah. Now, there are two famous stories in 2 Maccabees. One story is of a 90-year-old righteous Jew, all right, who refused to eat pig flesh as a sign to renounce his faith. That had become a very big thing. The Greeks were forcing religious Jews to renounce Yahweh, and in doing so, in order to make a public spectacle of them so that everyone would see and fear the Greeks, they would force these Jews to eat pig flesh in front of everybody. So we have this 90-year-old righteous Jew who has followed the Torah his whole life. And now he's at the end of his life, and he's being asked to abandon his faith. He even has some of the Jews around him trying to get him to spare his life, saying, well, just put the pig flesh kind of up to your lips and kind of just, you know, make it seem like you're eating it, but don't really eat it, you know, and then that might spare your life. Well, this Jew answers them and says he will not. Why would he, his whole life, be faithful to Yahweh, and then at the very end, at the time of testing, abandon his faith? And then he goes on to share, you know, and I'm paraphrasing this story, but he goes on to share that what would the younger generation do if they saw him? If the younger generation sees him abandon his faith at 90 years of age, what will it say for them? What will it do for them? And so he allows the Greeks to put him to death. He refuses to eat the pig flesh. So here you have, again, why eating pig can often be a very sensitive topic to those who follow the Torah, whether Jew or Gentile. Okay, they know the time of the Maccabees. They know the time of Hanukkah on what was emphasized at that time. And so there, of course, would become a great disdain for pig, even more so than prior to this event. So again, you can see why the discussion is so concerning to first century Jews who are coming into the kingdom through the blood of Yeshua. We need to kind of hammer this out. We need to talk about this. What does Torah really say versus what does the oral law say? Is there any violation going on? Because the words of Yeshua need to be followed. He never came to abolish the Torah or the prophets or the writings. He came to fulfill them which means properly do them, okay? Now, the second story is of a mother with seven sons who all went through different ways of torture for not renouncing or denouncing the Yah of Abraham and his covenants. So each son was presented before the mother, and they tortured those sons in various ways, trying to get those sons to renounce their faith. And one by one, each son allowed himself to be put to death. They refused 
the mother was there encouraging them to be strong and then of course the mother is put to death at the end of the story the pressure to assimilate was huge in the land of israel many jews did adapt and begin following other gods including learning the greek language to spare their lives there were also jews who came to enjoy the greek life and abandoned judaism marry gentile women and turned in fellow Jews to be killed. They were known in Israel as apostate Jews. Second Maccabees chapter 6, verses 12 through 17 shares how many Jews believed because of the sin present. This punishment they were experiencing was from Yah, and they were being disciplined for their rebelliousness. Let's look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. Show us how the time of the Maccabees, I'm sorry, shows us how the time of the Maccabees was a shadow of something still to come. A future Hanukkah still awaits all believers in Yeshua. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25 says, He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Now, this word saints here means Torah observant people. Okay? Wearing out the saints, saints are followers of Yeshua, and Yeshua never abandoned the Torah. And so these are Torah observant followers of Yeshua in the future. Okay, He will wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law. All right, the times and the law. What law are we speaking of? Torah. What law did Antiochus IV abolish? The Torah. Okay. So he's going to think to change the times. No more feast days. Okay, no more celebrating the feast. In other words, no more temple service also going on. And he's going to change the law. This is Torah. If this was just, you know, the laws of the land in a secular society, that's no big deal. That happens all the time. But this particular law is Torah. It's not Christian law. It's not Western Christianity law. It's Yah's law, and Yah's law is Torah. And so just like Antiochus IV wanted to be called God, called himself God manifest, Epiphanes, uh, he wanted to be worshipped, and he was able to what? Kill tens of thousands of Jews, and so he's wearing out the saints of the Most High, all right? and he's changing the times in the law. The same is still in the future. Okay. It says, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Okay? We're going to see that Hanukkah was three years, not three and a half, as far as everything that I have studied. If anybody has anything different, please go ahead and send it to me. But this, to me, is speaking of a future event still to happen. This has not fully been fulfilled yet. Even Yeshua says in Matthew 24, when you see the Obama abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel in the holy place or in that area I'm paraphrasing basically flee to the hills and pray that this whole situation doesn't happen on a sabbath so go ahead and read that in Matthew chapter 24 the maccabean revolt and the maccabean victory had already happened by the time of yeshua so he is speaking of a future event this daniel 725 is still yet to come which is a good reason why we celebrate Hanukkah. Not only are we celebrating the victory that Yah gave the Maccabees and how there was a temple when Yeshua arrived and he could fulfill the covenant that he needed to fulfill, but also there is an event still coming and it's preparing us for that. So there are many, many reasons why believers in Yeshua should follow the celebration of Hanukkah. It's not commanded by Yah. It is a tradition, it's optional, but it would be very beneficial for people to celebrate Hanukkah. All right, more proof, the shadow of the Maccabees shows us a future Hanukkah still to come for all believers in Yeshua is Daniel 8, chapter 22, verse, I'm sorry, ch chapter 8, verses 22 through 25, which says, as for the horn that was broken in the place of which four others arose, so the big horn here is Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire and the four other horns that rise out once the 
one horn is broken are the four generals that we talked about in part one. So they'll create four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power, okay? Not with Alexander's power, right? He died. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power, and he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. He's going to be destroying Torah observant believers. Okay? By his cunning, he shall make the seat prosper under his hand, and in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. So we know this is a future. The future anti-Mashiach will place himself into the temple area to be worshiped as God. He will think of himself as a God. He will do deceit to deceive many. And what will he do? He shall rise up against the what? Prince of princes. This is Yeshua. And he shall be broken, but by no human hands. When Yeshua returns, who is he going to destroy? Who is he going to make war with and have victory over the anti-Mashiach that is in the future? And so he is going to eventually come from the sky, we know, because as he left the disciples, so he shall return. And so this anti-Mashiach being spoken of here in verse 25 is the future anti-Mashiach. He is the antichrist. All right, and Yeshua will come and destroy him because it, the destruction of this kingdom in the future is not going to be done by human hands. All right, 2 Maccabees chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, reports just prior to the revolt, some had visions of horsemen and soldiers appearing in the skies of Judea, which reminds them of the time of Elijah was surrounded by the enemy and his servant is frightened. Elijah prays that Yah opens his eyes, and as the servant looks up towards the mountains, he sees chariots of fire and angels standing by. Elijah says, fear not, for there are more for us than against us. And so in 2 Maccabees, prior to that revolt, when they're undergoing all of this pressure here, they are seeing visions in the skies of a spiritual warfare going on. And it was encouraging to them. It made them think of the time of Elijah and that event that occurred. Okay. Oftentimes, we have to remember, and you see this in the book of Daniel, you see that spiritual warfare going on between the angel and the prince of Persia when the angel was trying to bring that message to Daniel and he was delayed 21 days. There is spiritual warfare going on. Kingdoms. Okay. There are Elohim, there are gods, created beings over the nations. There are fallen Elohim, okay? And they are rebelling against the ways of Yahweh. He placed them over there for the purpose of them leading the people to him. But these now are fallen angels who are leading the people to worship them as gods, okay? Elohim are created divine beings created by Yahweh. Even though Yahweh is an Elohim, there's only one Elohim who's uncreated and infinite, and that is Yahweh. So we have to keep all this in mind. There is spiritual warfare going on. Over the pagan kingdoms are fallen angels who are Elohim, who have been leading these, um, these nations away from proper worship, away from the laws of Yah, in which is one of the reasons why Israel was created. They were created to be a light to the nations. But of course, the kingdom of darkness wants to snuff out the Israelites and destroy them and eliminate them from the earth. So this is, there's much surrounding a spiritual warfare when it comes to the story of Hanukkah. All right, now we're still in 168 BC. One day, a Grecian small army comes to a town named Modin. You find that in 1 Maccabees chapter 2. 
This is a place where a priest named Mattathias and his five sons lived. The Greeks demanded Mattathias come forward and give a sacrifice, a pig, to Zeus. All right, Mattathias is a righteous Jew, very well liked in the area. And to get somebody of that esteem to go ahead and submit to the Greek army and the Greek way of life, the Greek laws, would, be, would have a great impact on that town. And the other Jews, they figured, would just fall into submission. Mattathias refused to bow to the Greeks. A fellow apostate Jew, a governor, along with one of the king's officers, stepped up to give the sacrifice to Zeus on the altar. Mattathias, said to be 80 years old, stepped up and killed them both along with a few others with a sword. The author of the Maccabees connects this to the zeal of Pinchas, who killed Zimri in the wilderness, Numbers 25. Psalms 106, verses 28 through 30. Okay, if you remember Pinchas, who is a priest, and the Moabite women at that time have come down and caused the men of Israel to run after their foreign gods and commit um, sexual immorality with the Moabite women. And during this time, a Israelite priest and a Moabite princess are now having sex in front of the tent of meeting, Pinchas, with righteous anger, takes a staff and runs them through. All right, a plague had broken out at this time because Yahweh was angry with what was going on, and he saw this righteous anger of Pinchas, and the plague ceased, and he also blessed Pinchas and his line that they would forever worship Yahweh that his line, his priesthood line, would, would forever worship him uh, before him, doing their priestly duties, okay? This is where we get that the line of Pinchas, which leads all the way back to the line of Aaron, is the line for the high priest, okay? Zadok is going to be one of the sons of Phineas, of Pinchas. So this is where you get that story. So when they see Mattathias do this, and he has this righteous zeal, where he refuses to bow and he kills these Greek officers and this Jewish uh, apostate Jew, they, they're reminded of this story of Phineas. So here's just a picture of where Moadim is, all right, roughly you know, 15, 16 miles or so from Jerusalem. So like a day's walk, at least the day's walk there um, is where this event took place. After Mattathias dies, one year later, he put Judah, or some people can say Judas. Judah and Judas are the same Hebrew word, the same Hebrew name. All right, this third of five sons, nicknamed the Maccabee, in charge of the military. Why is he in charge of the military? Because of what Mattathias did a year ago, the righteous Jews, the ones who want to keep Torah, all had to flee and run for the hills. And they began to do guerrilla warfare against the Greeks. They couldn't stand up to the Greeks head on, so they began to do guerrilla warfare, and they were winning victories. So for a year, Mattathias was in charge of any, everything, and when he dies, he places his third son, Judas, okay, nicknamed the Maccabee. The term Maccabee means the hammer. That's the nickname that he received, okay? Now, Mattathias is of the Hasmodean line, okay? You're gonna see this word Hasmodean dynasty later on. This is from the line of Mattathias. Now, Mattathias is from the priestly line. So um, he is also in the qualification of being a high priest. He does follow the correct line. Now, let's go on. So he's going to place his son Judas, or Judah, in charge of the military, whom later, after many battles, retook the temple grounds and restored everything, but the battles were just beginning. So he battles for another two more years, and he eventually at least gets the temple ground area, but that's just the beginning, all right? He doesn't have full control of all of Israel. He just has control 
of certain parts of Yerushalayim, which would include the temple ground area. Okay. After retaking the temple in 165 BC, cleansing it and offering the first sacrifice or offering on the 25th of Kislev, which three years ago was the exact day it was defiled, they vowed to celebrate this event every year to honor Yah who gave them the victory. So on the 25th of Kislev, three years prior, is when Antiochus IV offered that pig on the altar. He shut down Torah altogether. He, he outlawed Torah. Okay, it's on that exact same day that they begin to offer proper offerings back up to Yahweh. Okay, they took the temple prior to that. They had a little bit of time to cleanse it, get it ready. There's a lot that kind of happened there. But on the 25th of Kislev, exactly three years from the time it was defiled, and this is in the writings of Josephus too, they were able to get the temple worship ceremony and system up and running again. Okay, This is one of the big reasons why we are celebrating Hanukkah. It's a rededication of the temple. The temple has been rededicated back to Yahweh. And we know that Hanukkah means dedication. So the book of 2 Maccabees 1.9 tells one reason the celebration of Hanukkah is eight days is because it relates to the feast of Yah called Sukkot or tabernacles or booths or shelters. Okay, it has several names. Keep in mind the month of Kislev is the ninth month of the Hebrew calendar and the feast of Sukkot is created in the seventh month. The Jews would have missed Sukkot because of the defiling of the temple and their lack of control of it. Now in the ninth month, they have control. So this could be why they chose eight days to celebrate Hanukkah. Okay, It, it doesn't say exactly why they chose eight days, but this makes the most sense. Okay, um, They've gone three years without any Torah observance without any offerings being offered to Yahweh, without any of the feast days being done. They finally take the temple grounds. Sukkot has already passed. They want to celebrate this great victory that Yah gave them. Of course, that would be in their minds. Why don't we do it to the number of days of Sukkot since we just missed celebrating Sukkot? It makes a lot of sense to me. Second Maccabees 1, 7 through 9 says, starting with verse 7, when Demetrius, the second of king, the second, I'm sorry, when Demetrius the second was king of Syria, okay, so this is after Antiochus the fourth is dead, and his son Antiochus the fifth is dead. Demetrius the second is king. He wrote to tell you about the persecution and the hard times that came upon us in the years after Jason revolted against the authority in the Holy Lands. Okay, now remember in part one, all the way back to Jason, okay, Jason tried to um, force his way to, into becoming high priest because he got ousted by Menelaus, all right, he caused a great revolt against the authority in the Holy Land, and Jason and his men set fire to the temple gates and slaughtered innocent people. Then we prayed to Yah, and he answered our prayers. So there's a lot that happened after that, okay? It is that revolt that got Antiochus IV very upset. That was one of the reasons why he swept through Jerusalem and killed tens of thousands of people was this revolt that we talked about in part one. So Demetrius II is writing about this. And then it's from that point on, Jews are praying for deliverance. And later, Yah answers their prayers, which is why we have Hanukkah. So we sacrificed animals, gave offerings of grain, lit the lamps in the temple, and set out the sacred loaves. This is why we urge you to celebrate in the month of Kislev a festival similar to the festival of shelters, booths, tabernacles, or Sukkot. Okay? So again, it's just giving you another reason why Hanukkah is related to Sukkot. That's why it's eight days, but they're celebrating the victory from which Yah gave them. Now, if you're a believer like me, that Yeshua is of the same nature and essence as the Father, though distinct and separate, 
then you include Yeshua in this victory. He, along with Father Yah, gave them the victory. So why would we not celebrate a victory that Yeshua and Father Yah were involved in? This cements the uh, fact that the temple will be up and running when the Messiah comes. All right. If there is no Hanukkah, there is no Yeshua. There is no Messiah. The temple, according to scriptures that Yeshua must fulfill, needs to be up and running in order for Yeshua to come. 2 Maccabees chapter 10, verses 5 through 8 says, They dedicated the temple on the 25th day of the month of Kislev, the same day of the same month on which the temple had been desecrated by the Gentiles. The happy celebration lasted eight days, like the festival of shelters or Sukkot booths. And the people remembered how only a short time before they had spent the festival of shelters, Sukkot, wandering like wild animals in the mountains and living in caves. And that's what a lot of righteous Jews had to do. And this is a future event coming. This is a shadow of the future event coming. And we'll talk a, a lot more about that when we get to part three of this teaching. And we're going to talk about Yochanan chapter 10, John chapter 10, where Yeshua uh, is there during the time of Hanukkah in the temple area. And we'll talk a little bit more about Matthew 24 that I have mentioned earlier, where Yeshua talks about the abomination of desolation spoken of in Daniel. So people will be living, they were just recently living like animals in the mountains and, um, and the caves. So they are celebrating this great victory. But now carry green palm branches and sticks decorated with ivory. They paraded around singing grateful praises to him who had bought or brought about the purification of his own temple. Everyone agreed that the entire Jewish nation should celebrate the festival each year. So as we go back here to the previous slide, remember we're reading 2 Maccabees 10, 5 through 8, and it just said that they were wandering like wild animals in the mountains and living in caves. Verse 7 says, but now they're carrying green palm branches and sticks decorated with ivory. Remember back when Antiochus IV was forcing them to worship Dionysus with a parade wearing wreaths and ivory to worship that pagan god. Now they are using green palm branches and sticks decorated with ivory, parading around giving praises to Yah. So this should be a really red flag for all of us when we start accusing people of doing some type of pagan worship, okay, when they might be using some type of symbolism that is used in pagan worship, like wreaths and ivory, and they're turning around and using it to worship Yah, they're not doing anything wrong. They're using something that Yah created in honor and worship of Him. Just because the pagans use certain symbols or certain items, for their pagan worship doesn't make that thing totally off limits now and can't be used to worship Yah. It depends on who you're worshiping and who you're bowing down to. Even if we look in King Solomon's time when he created the temple and built it, one thing that I always point people towards is the labor, the labor, the water um, labor that the priests used to wash themselves with that is in the temple area. He set it upon golden oxen. Okay, golden oxen are symbols used in pagan worship in other pagan nations. But this wasn't considered paganism to put the golden labor on those golden oxen. Nobody was bowing down to those oxen and worshiping uh, Yahweh with those oxen. So those they were just symbols. They were decoration in the temple grounds area. He had other various symbols and decorations inside the temple area, pomegranates and, and various things, palm trees, and it wasn't considered pagan, though many of those things are used in pagan worship in other nations. So we need to be very careful on how 
we go about this when we try to accuse Western Christianity of paganism uh, when, in essence, they really aren't, okay? Now, making something an idol in your heart, that's a totally different subject. We're talking about just using something as a decoration, symbolizing a victory from Yah and worshiping him, not bowing down to it and calling it a pagan god, okay? There is a difference, and it's not off limits for believers in Yeshua to use specific things as decoration, lighting candles like we are at Hanukkah. Pagans light candles to their gods. Well, we light candles for the victory that Yah has given us. It's not pagan. So please be careful, because during this time, of course, we have the Christmas discussion all the time during the time of Hanukkah. Christmas is pagan, all of that. We need to reevaluate that and look at that honestly. Is it really pagan? Something to think about. All right. Sorry, I got on a rabbit trail there. All right. So there is a story in the Talmud we want to talk about concerning Hanukkah. Okay. It's not found anywhere in the Maccabean stories, the first four books of the Maccabees. It's not found in the works of Josephus. Okay. It's not found in any of the Gospels or any of the Apocrypha books. It's found in the Talmud, this story. Let's go on. Another story behind the eight days of Hanukkah is in the Talmud, which states, when the royal Hasmonean family overpowered and was victorious over the Greeks, they searched and found only a single cruise of pure oil, enough to light the menorah for a single day. A miracle occurred, and they lit the menorah with this oil for eight days. On the following year, they established these eight lights, or eight days, as days of festivity and praise and thanksgiving to Yah. You find us in the Talmud, Shabbat 21b. This story shows up around 500 years after Yeshua's death and resurrection. Many struggle with this story being true, but it isn't beyond Yah's capabilities, okay? It doesn't show up till 500 years after Yeshua, but on the other hand, it's not beyond Yah's capabilities to have a cruise of oil, which is only enough for one day, last eight days. All right, we have to understand that according to this story, you know, they wanted to light the menorah, but they, all, but they needed eight days worth of oil to light it for eight days. Well, they only had one cruise of oil. And it takes roughly seven to eight days to make new holy oil. So this oil lasted that long while they made new holy oil is kind of how the story goes. All right. I'll let you decide whether it's true or not. But the stronger argument seems to be the eight days were picked because they just missed Sukkot previously. Now the Talmud also says in Menachot 28b, the Maccabees were unable to obtain a solid gold menorah for the temple as the Torah specifies. Lacking the means for such an expensive menorah, they constructed a simple one out of iron rods plated with tin. All right. So we, it's another story in the Talmud. It's possible. I mean, there were no more gold objects in the temple area when they took it. Obviously, Antiochus IV would have took and emptied the treasury there and empty of it all, of all its treasures. He needed it to keep his conquest going, to keep expanding his empire. So when they retake the temple, the Maccabees, there isn't going to be any gold. There's not going to be a whole lot of gold, at least, around that city, around the area of Jerusalem. So this is possible that they reconstructed um, a menorah out of iron rods that were lying around. Now, I also have heard a legend that shares that these iron rods were used to beat Jews. Okay, so they're using the very iron rods that were used to beat the Jews in order to make a menorah and light the light that is to light the presence of Yah in the temple area. So interesting legend. All right, possible, could be true. Um, I'll let you guys decide. Now, Antiochus IV would try many times to crush the revolt, but would fail. Okay, remember, they took the temple grounds and they got things up and running. But that doesn't mean that they've got the whole land of Israel under control. Antiochus IV, he's going to try and take everything back. But the Maccabees, 
are going to be able to maintain control of the temple. All right. After failing to ransack a temple from its money within his empire by battle and hearing, by battle and hearing his armies fail to take Jerusalem again, Antiochus IV is said to have fallen ill. It was believed he fell ill to an intestinal disease. He confesses at this time he should not have oppressed the Jewish people as he did. He should have let them keep their Torah laws and customs as his previous successors did. After his son, I mean, after his death, his son, Antiochus V, soon continued to try and take the Jewish people back under his rule only to fail. Okay, so Antiochus IV is going to die, supposedly by this intestinal disease. Many people will say that that was brought upon by supernatural means by Yah. All right, we don't know. But he does more than likely die from this disease. His dying breath, they say he is renouncing what he did to the Jews. He wished he would have never done it. Um, but that doesn't change his son's mind. Antiochus V is going to try and do what his father couldn't do, but he's going to fail. Now, Antiochus V and his commander, Lysias, are later put to death by his cousin, Demetrius I. Now, remember, this Demetrius I is the son of Seleucus IV, who was once a hostage in Rome. This is the son who was exchanged for Antiochus IV, okay? Remember, Seleucus IV and Antiochus IV are brothers. Seleucus IV is the older brother, and he wanted to get his younger brother out from being a hostage from Rome, so he gives Demetrius over to Rome. Well, eventually, Demetrius is able to come home. Now, he takes over, and he has Antiochus V killed, okay? He kills his own cousin. Now, Demetrius makes friends with an apostate Jew named Alcimius, who wanted to be the high priest. Demetrius also made the Hides commander of his armies and sends him to Jerusalem to make a treaty with the Maccabees, but it was only a trick to get them to lay down their arms. The Maccabees saw through the trickery and were ready when the Greeks tried to fight again. The Greeks again were unsuccessful and more fighting continued after this. Soon the Maccabees will try to go to Rome for help so they can remain in power. They send men to them to try and create a treaty along with an alliance. The Romans accept and now fight anyone who tries to attack the Jews. The Seleucids under Demetrius I gets word of this and knows they must attack quickly. A huge battle occurs and Judas Maccabee, the great military leader, dies. Okay, so he has had many victories. He's the one that helped take the temple back, get it back up and running. In this huge battle, all right, he, his life is taken. He dies. His brother, Jonathan, takes over from there. Okay, he's still one of the five brothers. Remember, Mattathias had five sons, and Jonathan is one of those sons. Judas is one of those sons. Okay, all right, much fighting continues until after, till another Seleucid named Alexander Epiphanes rises and wishes to take over. He offers friendship to the Jews, okay? He doesn't want to, he's already seen all the fighting going on. He knows that he can't beat them, so he offers friendship to them, okay? Demetrius I is out of the picture now. We have Alexander Epiphanes who has risen. He's making an, um, a treaty with the Jews. As we look back at the Maccabees, many Christians really don't understand what they were really fighting for. We know they were fighting for the rights of the Jewish people and for their religion based in Yah's Torah to survive. But do we really know how the Maccabees fought and died for the injustice delivered against normal, everyday Jews? There were many Jews who didn't want to fight, didn't want to go to war, but they were being forced to abandon their religious beliefs and the persecution was great. They were giving up their lives for it. But they weren't even looking for trouble. They weren't trying to uh, cause any type of war or trouble. 
right? There were many Jews killed because they didn't become engulfed in the Greek culture and corruption. They were people who simply loved Yah more than the ways of the world and just wanted to live in a way Yah chose for his people, okay? But in the future, again, there's going to be a time where there is going to be another Hanukkah. There's going to be a dictator that's going to arise. He's going to be the anti-Mashiach who's going to do many similar things that Antiochus IV did, only to, in the end, fail. But many people are going to die at his hand. So celebrating Hanukkah helps us to be ready and understand there's still a future Hanukkah to come. And we can celebrate the victory that Yeshua and Father Yah gave the Maccabees and that there was a temple there when Yeshua came. There's a lot to celebrate with Hanukkah. When the Greek empire finally came to an end, many things came from that period in Israel's history. When Jonathan, son of Mattathias, leader after Judas Maccabee died, died in 142 BC, his brother Simon, the oldest of the five brothers, took over and a dynasty began called the Hasmonean dynasty. These descendants of Mattathias took on power that was not theirs to have. They basically declared themselves kings and high priests of Israel. All right, that's not something that they were permitted to do. All right, they made sure that they remained in the high priest position, so they weren't casting lots, they weren't doing it properly according to Torah, and they declared themselves kings. All right, they began to expand Israel's territories back to the borders Yah had first given Israel. This dynasty lasted 103 years and was known for forcing the people they conquered to become proselytes to Judaism. All right, that was one thing that Judas Maccabee did as a failure, as after he took the temple area and after they began to take villages back from the Greek empire, Judas Maccabee and his descendants, you know, the descendants of Mattathias, would force people to convert to Judaism, okay? They would do it against their will. If people don't want to convert to Judaism or don't want to be a part of the covenant, they should just be exiled out from the land, okay? Because that land belongs to Yah, it belongs to Yahweh. Israel is to be a light to the nations. They are to institute the Torah law. And if, the, if people don't want to live according to the Torah, then they should be allowed to go ahead and leave. You don't force people to become covenant people because their hearts aren't in it. They're not truly being converted over to following Father Yah. And so, but Mattathias, his son, uh, Judas Maccabee, He's forcing the Jews to take on circumcision who don't want it. And he's forcing Gentiles to be circumcised. Anybody in the land, he was forcing them to become circumcised. Okay, he had this zeal. Now the zeal kind of swung the wrong way. Okay, you don't, Torah doesn't permit you to do that. But we can see now that when they had all that stuff taken away from them, all the Torah laws, and, and he's watching uh, fellow Jews being put to death for not being circumcised and, and not following the ways and the mothers are being thrown off the city walls with their babies wrapped around their necks. You can, you can kind of have a little bit of compassion and understand why Judas Maccabee did what he did, but it was still wrong. It was still wrong and it does cause problems later on. By the time we get to the time of Yeshua, we've got this real sensitive issue about circumcision and a real sensitive issue about how much fellowship a Jew can have with a Gentile. And it went overboard. It wasn't according to Torah. It was too extreme. All right. At this time, the Perashim, who were just a small group of sages called the Hasidim, would begin to grow and seek power. After the Hasmadean dynasty ceased, they grew slowly into a very powerful sect. They developed many ways of teaching Torah. They would institute thousands of hedge laws during the the period leading up to the time of Yeshua. Rabbinic schools were developed and established to help train future sages. The development of synagogues became very strong and the communities made their cornerstones, made them cornerstones of their towns. A real anticipation of a future Messiah just continued to grow. Many false messiahs tried to surface, but it wouldn't take long for them to dissolve. 
people continue to look for a Messiah in the form of a Judas Maccabee every Hanukkah. He was to deliver them from the rule of the Romans. So by the time of the 60s BC or so, Rome really takes over Jerusalem. Okay, they really put their their uh, rulership over top of it. They start um, having their presence there. Okay, and at that time, boy, people were really looking for a Messiah to come to free them from the Romans, and they were looking for a Judas Maccabee. They were looking for someone like him. Okay. Every Hanukkah, it was extremely um, sensitive. They were waiting. Could the Messiah show up? Could a Judas of Maccabee show up at this time? Well, we're going to find out in our next teaching, a Messiah does show up. But at this time, he's not going to be a Judas of Maccabee. He's going to be Yeshua, saving them through grace and mercy. But there's an importance to this story and why uh, Yeshua did what he did during the time of Hanukkah. And yes, Yeshua, of course, he's going to celebrate Hanukkah. He's the one that gave them the victory. Nothing they were doing was violating Torah. So it's a tradition that doesn't violate Torah, but uplifts a victory that Yah gave them. So of course, Yeshua is going to be celebrating it. But just so you know, that's what they're waiting for, a Messiah during this time of Hanukkah that would be like a Judas Maccabee. What many people think of as 400 years of silence were some of the most fertile times in Jewish history. The Perishim, or the Pharisees, gained great popularity with the people. Synagogues became strong places of worship, community centers for towns and villages, rabbinic schools and rabbis were flourishing. The whole way Yeshua would minister when he came was developed during this time. Remember, Yeshua is a rabbi. He is going to teach and minister in a way that the people understand. And a lot of those traditional ways of teaching and expressing uh, the ways of living Torah were flourishing and come forth from this time period. Okay? Yeshua is going to have to straighten out some overemphasis and some hedge laws that are weighty on the people. But the whole technique and style, parables, all of those things that Yeshua does, comes from this period of time. Yeshua is just not making this stuff up, okay? He's giving them the Torah and giving them the truth about Father Yahweh in a way they understand that was developed prior to his coming. By the time of Yeshua, a man named King Herod had made the temple and its grounds into one of the wonders of the world. The temple complex had grown to some 40 acres. The temple was Yah's goal for teaching the people of Israel his desire about coming down and dwelling in the midst of his people. The temple was the foreshadow of Yah's goal for his son to come and die so Yah could dwell in us. Now, when it comes to the time of Hanukkah, I often get asked, well, were they lighting Hanukkahs at that time? Were they lighting candles? And yes, they were. During the time of Yeshua, they were already lighting candles. Now, there was a disagreement on how to light them, what the tradition should be. But there is no doubt when we look at the Talmud and we look at the sages of the first century and how it's recorded, their discussions, they were lighting candles in the first century. Let's go ahead and look. Here in the Talmud, Tractate Masaket Shabbat 21b, starting with verse 5. The sages taught the basic mitzvah of Hanukkah is each day to have a light kindled by a person, the head of the household, for themselves and their household. And the mehadrin, that word means those who are super strict in the performance of the mikvah, kindle a light for each and everyone in the household. And the mehadrin min ha mehadrin, okay, these are super, super strict observant. Uh, Jews, who are even more meticulous, adjust the number of lights daily. Okay, so they adjust the lights daily. They're going to do a light for each day. Now, and Beit Shammai, that's the house of Shammai, that's a rabbinic school. He's a very famous um, rabbi. He was the one that was president of the Sanhedrin when Yeshua was ministering his three and a half years. Okay, and then you have the Beit House of Hillel, the Beit Hillel. 
okay? Hillel was the president of the Sanhedrin up until 10 BC. I'm sorry, 10 CE, 10 CE, all right? He died in 10 CE, and that's when Shammai took over. So Shammai's um, rabbinical school or whatever, and Shammai himself takes over. They become the most powerful school uh, in 10 CE, and they are there still when Yeshua comes on the scene later on when he does his three years of ministry, they are the parashim that is giving Yeshua the hardest time. They are extremely strict when it comes to not just the Torah, but the oral law. They were the ones that really hammered the oral law heavy on the people. So the Beit Shammai is kind of the heavy conservatives of the day. Beit Hillel is more you know, liberal, more relaxed, when it comes to oral law, when it comes to uh, the teaching of the Torah. And so these two schools were often in conflict with one another. There's well over 300 uh, shared instances in the Talmud of disagreements between these two houses. So you can read about those if you choose to in the Talmud. And so they're disagreeing here as to the nature of that adjustment, all right? How do we do the eight candles? Beit Shammai says on the first day, one kindles, whoops, sorry about that. Beit Shammai says on the first day, one kindles eight candles, and then from there gradually decreases the number of lights until on the last day of Hanukkah, they kindle one light. And Beit Hillel says on the first day, one kindles one light, and from there on gradually increases the number of lights until on the last day, they kindle eight lights. All right, so as you can tell at the beginning of this series in part one, the tradition that I was showing you about the Hanukkah is according to the house of Hillel. All right, after the destruction of the temple, it's the house of Hillel that will eventually prevail and be the dominant uh, influence on Judaism. The house of Shammai basically goes into non existence after the destruction of the temple. So today, many traditions that you see in Orthodox Judaism is after the school of Hillel. This being one of them, the tradition of Hanukkah and how to light the candles comes after the house of Hillel, which of course dates back to the first century and dates back to the time of Yeshua. Now, just as a side note, keep in mind, Shaul or Paul came from the house of Hillel, all right? He was a um, student of Gamaliel, and Gamaliel is the grandson of Hillel. So that's just to kind of give you a side note, that's where Paul comes from, the school of Hillel. All right, so we've come to the end of part two of our series here on Hanukkah. The next time together, I want to have our focus on Yeshua. I want to talk about Yochanan John chapter 10 and a little bit about Matthew chapter 24, because again, without a Hanukkah, there is no Yeshua. If you read Daniel chapter 9, verses, I believe, 25 through 28, right around there, you will see that the Messiah needs to be alive because he's going to be cut off before the destruction of the temple. The destruction of the temple is going to come after the Messiah is cut off. So you can't have the Greeks having a victory and Jews becoming basically extinct in the land of Israel, and there is no temple up and running, for the, and then the Messiah comes, okay? That would not allow Yeshua to fulfill certain passages prophesied for him. So without a Hanukkah, there is no Yeshua. One, another reason why I celebrate Hanukkah. Amen. So let's go ahead and go to the blessing of Aaron the ironic blessing, in order to end our time together. All right, here we have the ironic blessing. You can find it in Bab Midbar, Book of Numbers, chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. We'll go ahead and say it in Hebrew first, and then we'll say it in English. Yevarechecha Yahweh ve'ishmerecha, ya'er Yahweh patnav elecha ve'unika. Yasa Yahweh Pa'anav Elacha Beasem Lacha Shalom. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face shine to you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Shalom, everyone.